Wolfgang here. Morning, everyone. Oh, here. Let's find seats. Okay. Good morning. I'm Jane Harmon, the president and CEO of the Wilson Center, and uh, as I always say, a recovering politician. It is not a 12 step program, um, but I'm very happy and fortunate. Uh, to be in this role. Uh, I do want to recognize U.S. Ambassador to Egypt, Robert Beecroft. I think he is here. There he is. Uh, welcome, sir. Uh, and to underscore uh, the title of today's event, which is Mutual Security on Hold, question mark, Russia, the West, and European Security <coughs> Architecture. Uh, this conversation could not come at a more important time uh, with events in, Lucra in Ukraine looming large on the global agenda. Uh, I was thinking about it earlier, and I suppose one piece of good news about the uh, assault of the ISIS uh, extremist organization in Iraq is that uh, Russia is distracted. Uh, what is Russia distracted by? Uh, Ukraine uh, and uh, the disintegrating relations uh, with Europe, its disintegrating relations with Europe and the U.S., uh, the downing of a military tra a transport plane uh, in East Ukraine on Saturday has created outrage in Kiev. Uh, the Russian embassy there was substantially damaged by an angry mob. Uh, fortunately, the, the event was diffused by the foreign minister of Ukraine, although a comment he made there has uh, obviously gone viral. Um, at any rate, no one really believes that Russia isn't meddling and fomenting some instability in eastern Ukraine, and that makes it much harder for Petro Poroshenko, the uh, recently elected president, uh, to stand up an effective, transparent, uh, and um, corruption-free, let's try that, government uh, for the first time in Ukraine's history. I observed the election uh, uh, on the uh, National Democratic Institute, NDI, delegation led by uh, Madeleine Albright, we had a chance right before it to meet with the leading candidates, and Poroshenko certainly said the right things about the leadership he hopes to provide for Ukraine, and uh, it is uh, my personal wish that he's able to, to be successful. Uh, today's event is really, uh, although Ukraine will be a focus, to celebrate the role of the uh, Munich Security Conference and other organizations like the OSCE and the Wilson Center, who pay careful attention to Russia and other major security challenges. Uh, the Wilson Center has invested in these issues for 40 years. Ambassador George Kennan and others founded the Kennan Institute in 1974. It's the center's oldest program. And our Global Europe program, led by uh, Christian Osterman, who is uh, on today's panel, or I guess moderating it, uh, is the home of our newest distinguished scholar, who was the co-moderator of the OSCE's Ukrainian National Dialogue, Ambassador Wolfgang Issinger. We have 1,400 scholar alumni worldwide from our Kennan Institute, and 100 of them are on the ground right now in Ukraine. In fact, I met several of them, and three of them work in a small office that we still have in Kiev. So who better to keynote our program than someone who knows a lot about this region, Ambassador Zbig uh, Brzezinski. Zbig and I worked together. Uh, I didn't work for him, but I worked in a pair of, he was the big shot, I was the small shot, in the Carter White House in another century, when somehow the problems seemed a little easier, other than hostages in Iran and a few other things. Um, but Zbig uh, has uh, uh, continued uh, to think carefully about the strategic challenges uh, in the world and, uh, 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 and has, in my view, written some of the most important books that give the rest of us tools to think about those. During his tenure uh, in the Carter White House, he managed the normalization uh, uh, of relations with China, the signing of Saul II, the brokering of the Camp David Accords, the encouragement of dissidents in each Eastern Europe, and the fallout from the 1971 Iranian Re Revolution, although that didn't resolve until after President, immediately after President Carter left office. He is currently the senior research professor at Johns Hopkins, but I actually think he's the second most important member of his family after Mika. Uh, <laughs> after um, uh, Zvig's talk, um, uh, former U.S. Ambassador to Ukraine, Steve Pfeiffer, uh, will uh, make some comments. Uh, 
Uh, Steve and I testified together a few weeks ago before the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, which is focused intently on what strategies could be successful in Ukraine. Uh, but before any of that happens, let me uh, introduce uh, Wilson Scholar, Ambassador Wolfgang Issinger, uh, who will talk a bit more about the uh, S Munich Security Conference's most recent anniversary uh, volume. Uh, Wolfgang has chaired the Munich Security Conference since 2008, following a very successful career in Germany's Foreign Service, where he was a uh, deputy foreign minister, ambassador to the U.S. Uh, during the 9-11 period, and then ambassador to the U.K. Uh, the book that he produced, which was released at uh, this uh, past February's conference, uh, includes chapters written by various folks. I was honored to write the chapter on Nunn Luger and last year uh, to be involved in a celebration of Senator Sam Nunn for his enormous contributions uh, in, in the area of uh, nuclear security. Uh, the conference each February is the security event in the world. Uh, our Congress sends a major delegation there, and I think I'm up to year 14 attending it. Um, one last thing about Wolfgang before I introduce him. Among his other extraordinary accomplishments, uh, he is, of course, a grandfather, but he's also a father of a nine-year-old. And so I've been waiting, Wolfgang, to wish you happy Father's Day. Please welcome uh, Ambassador Wolfgang Issinger. Thank you so much, Jane. And uh, thank you, Zbig and, and Steve, and of course, Christian, for uh, allowing us to have this session here this morning. Uh, both Jane Harmon and Zbig Brzezinski were, of, of course, participating once again after many previous uh, sessions at the Munich Security Conference earlier this year. And I remember that you, Zbig, uh, participated in a session on Ukraine at a moment when many of us were still considering Ukraine a problem of Ukrainians. Um, and of course now it has become a problem of uh, not only European but global dimensions and we'll talk more about that. Uh, so thanks, thank you for allowing me just to uh, <coughs> make a few brief remarks. I want to sort of present to you this book. There are uh, outside in the hall uh, a few copies of it and there is also a sheet where you if, you, if you want a copy, you can order a copy from a U.S. Uh, distribution company. Uh, Helmut Schmidt, Bill Cohen, Senator McCain, Sam Nunn, Joe Nye, Jim Hoagland, Jim Stavridis, uh, NATO Secretary General Rasmussen, uh, but also, uh, you know, non-Americans like Klaus Naumann, um, Carl Bildt, and of course, most importantly, Jane Harmon. Um, so, buy the book. It's uh, it's worth reading it. There are uh, really uh, some some real gems in the book. Um, and I'm I'm proud that we we uh, we worked on it uh, for almost a year to come up with with uh, uh, something on the anniversary of Munich. For those of you who have not had a chance to be in Munich, let me just make one comment about uh, the Munich Security Conference. It is at its core a transatlantic event. There are not many events uh, around the world uh, annually where you will find up to 10 active U.S. senators and a number of members of the House in one place for two days all together. That, that's a rare thing to see. I, 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 I've checked with my, many of my American diplomatic colleagues, and it's, it's uh, something that doesn't happen very often. So this strong participation, not only by, uh, by all U.S. administration since the, since the 1960s, but by the Congress, by those in the Congress who lead on foreign policy, is a huge uh, asset for the for the conference. Um, the conference was founded by Ewald von Kleist, who, for those of you who don't know who he was, he 
he was, until he passed away last year, the last surviving member of the group of people who tried to assassinate uh, Adolf Hitler in 1944. Um, and he had a quite a story to tell about how he escaped uh, death um, uh, and how, unfortunately, uh, the attempt uh, in 1944 uh, failed. Just uh, one or two words about our topic before I hand over to our keynote speaker, uh, Dr. Bushinsky. I had this opportunity to spend a few weeks in Ukraine on behalf of the OSCE chairman in office uh, during the month of May leading up to the presidential elections in Ukraine. I have to tell you that I did not meet many separatists, and I tried very hard. I went all over the country, and I found that there was huge dissatisfaction, enormous dissatisfaction, by many citizens with the conduct of their own government over the last decade or so because of corruption, because of uh, uh, la lack of uh, unity. Either there was somebody from the East running the country f from an Eastern point of view, or there was somebody from the West running the country from a Western point of view, etc. But I did not encounter uh, a great deal of support for the idea that Ukraine should be carved up. Neither, by the way, did I find a lot of uh, fascism or anti-Semitism, which is something that Russian propaganda has tended to suggest over the last uh, period. So we need to be careful that we don't let ourselves be driven into the wrong direction. Second point, my view, and I, I, I expect that Dr. Brzezinski and, and, and uh, Ambassador Pfeiffer will hopefully correct me if I'm wrong. My view is that Russian action on Ukraine has not been an action motivated by strength and strategic, uh, a strategic um, sense, but more out of weakness and in, in a way almost out of a sense of panic that certain things were sort of drifting apart that Russia thought was important for them. My Russian friend Dmitry Trenin, who represents the Carnegie Endowment in, in Moscow, has recently said Russia has three options now. Unfortunately, the only good option is the least likely one. He said um, the first option the Russians have is uh, self-improvement, uh, self-reliance, uh, more democracy. That's not very likely. The second option is that Russia will tend to rely more and more on, on, on military options. Certainly not a big war, but, but, but fomenting unrest continue to form an unrest in Ukraine and maybe in other crisis spots in Europe and beyond. And the third option for Russia, as Dmitry put it, is for Russia to, to, to leave the West and to go more to China, which they've already tried in a certain way. But that would be tantamount to Russia surrendering to China and would also not be uh, uh, such a good option. So my, I, I tend to agree with Dimitri. Uh, Russia uh, has a problem um, and has created a problem by the very behavior which we have seen. Finally, let me say that transatlantic coordination on how to deal with the Ukraine on the sanctions issue and beyond has actually been relatively good. We have stayed together. On the day I left Kiev, I asked the Prime Minister of, uh, of Ukraine what, if he had one wish, what would it be from the West? And he said to me, and I, I, I think I'm authorized to quote him, he said, Ambassador Ischinger, there's one thing you need to do. Make sure that everybody understands that what we need is Western cohesion. Don't allow yourselves to be falling apart once again. Between, within Europe and between Europe and the United States. We've actually been quite good at it, but it's not been easy. And one of the reasons why it's not easy, if you look at certain elements of the German and European public, is the loss of trust created by the quote-unquote Snowden NSA uh, affair. That is a handicap currently. And, and I, I 
I keep saying it while I'm here in this country. You shouldn't think that it will simply blow over. It is a it continues to be a serious uh, handicapping factor for European governments trying to work with uh, the United States in handling these types of emergencies. Last point, you might think, looking at Ukraine, that this ambitious title toward mutual security was, you know, uh, maybe an illusion. I believe, and I'm interested in hearing what our speakers will have to say, I believe that even if this is now a vision that is more remote than we thought two or three years ago it would be, uh, it's still an appropriate vision for a future where Europe is not going to be as divided as it is currently between the West and Russia, but where we will have a Europe whole and free, uh, including with a security architecture that works and with a kind of relationship of mutual trust uh, that would help us to renew relations with Russia in, uh, in, 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 in months and years to come, hopefully. With this, I stop and hand over to our keynote speaker, Dr. Brzezinski. President Harmon. That sounds pretty good, doesn't it? <laughs> Distinguished panelists, it's a pleasure to be here. Let me try to discuss the implications for the European security architecture of what Wolfgang Ischinger just addressed, namely the problem of the relationship of Russia to the West and Ukraine. What we are seeing in Ukraine, in my judgment, is not a peak, but a symptom of a more basic problem, namely the gradual but steady emergence in Russia over the last six or seven years of a quasi-mystical chauvinism, a relationship that the Russians feel is needed because of the collapse of the Soviet Union and the partial disintegration of the long-established Russian Empire. It's a longish report, but it's worth reading for those who are interested in international affairs. It deals particularly with several key concepts that this new view of the world contains, a view of the world created by the need the Russians around Putin and Putin himself have felt for a more comprehensive interpretation of what is the nature of Russia's position in the world and its relationship with the world and the West in particular. And it's in this context that the Ukrainian issue then becomes significant. And the key concepts of it, this report written by a group of people of some prominence in Moscow, involves four basic concepts. That of, and I quote, a divided people. Secondly, the theme of, quote, protecting compatriots abroad, unquote. Then more broadly, the Russian world, Ruski Mir in Russian, and the importance of acknowledging and sustaining, embracing and promoting, quote, the great Russian civilization. I mention this because I think it would be an error to think that Crimea and Ukraine are just the products of a sudden outrage. They are to some extent in terms of timing. It would have been much smarter for Russia to have what has been happening happen about 10 years from now, when Russia would be stronger, economically more solid. But it happened, and these concepts are important. A divided people is the point of departure for the chauvinistic claim that Russia's sovereignty embraces all Russians, wherever they are. And that has, for anyone familiar with European history, some ominously familiar sounds prior to World War II. It leads, of course, 
to the concept of protecting compatriots abroad. And that has special meaning for those countries which do have Russian ethnic nationals living in their society and who border on Russia. Uh, the divided people and the protecting of compatriots abroad then raises the question of the Russian world. And the notion here is of an organic integral unity between all Russians irrespective of their territorial location. Unless that territorial location can be altered favorably in reuniting the Russian people. Think of the Baltic states. And last but not least, the conviction that Russia is not part of the Western civilization, it is also not a part of China. It is not part of the Muslim world. Russia itself is a great civilization, a world civilization, which emphasizes a set of principles, some of which are not unfamiliar to our own society, such as, for example, strong commitment to a particular religion, but much stronger than in the West, where religion is part of a more complex um, social arrangement. The notion that the great Russian civilization stands for certain basic values, not only religious, but in terms of interpersonal relationships, to some extent, for example, condemning some of the changes in the relationship between the sexes and within the sexes that are now taking place in the world. In effect, Russia protects the integrity of certain basic beliefs that have characterized Christianity, but in the Russian view, Christianity is now betraying or permitting to slip away. So this is a comprehensive outlook and an ambitious outlook and an outlook which justifies then the conclusion that Russia is a world power. And nothing has hurt Putin lately in some of the international dialogue with the West than the words of President Obama, which credited Russia with being a significant regional power. Uh, he didn't have to say more in order to score a point that hurt. That is therefore an important point of departure for dealing with the Ukraine issue. The Ukraine issue is not a sudden peak, but a symptom, as I have said, of a basic problem. The emergence of the policies packaged within the larger philosophical framework which I've described. What can we therefore expect if Ukraine, in fact, is its manifestation, that problem will be difficult to resolve, and I think it will take time to resolve. But of course, resolution of it need not be a unilateral solution if the West has a stake in it, and the stake has to be then crystallized into a meaningful policy. The Ukraine problem may fade if it is contained, and especially if the Russian increasingly cosmopolitan middle class, which is surfacing but not dominant currently, becomes politically more important, perhaps repelled by its sense of vulnerability and disappointment in Putin, and at some point assumes a more significant political role when Putin has passed from the stage. But when? There's no way of predicting it. It could be soon, it could be a long time, but also a great deal will depend on whether what Ukraine has become as a symptom becomes a success or a failure from Putin's point of view. So in brief, the stakes are significant. In the most immediate sense, the stake involves, of course, the issue that the use of force in Crimea and the ongoing and sustained effort to destabilize parts of Ukraine poses a threat to the post-World War II notions of international arrangements, and particularly the exclusion of the use of force in resolving territorial issues. That, is a, that has been a cardinal assumption of the European order after World War II. And Russia has been part of it, including through the treaties that it has signed. But it now is challenging that. That is a significant threat 
in a broad sense, and an immediate threat, psychologically at least, but potentially, in view of Crimea, militarily, to the Baltic states, to Georgia, to Moldova, and more vaguely, indirectly, but perhaps potentially more successful than the others, Belarus, because Belarus does not have any external protection. The others that I've mentioned do in varying degrees. It follows from what I'm saying that the Ukrainian problem is a, is a challenge that the West, by which I mean the United States and Europe, and the NATO particularly, must address on three levels. We have to effectively deter the temptation facing the Russian leadership regarding the use of force. We have to deter the use of force, more simply put. We have to, secondly, to obtain the termination of Russia's deliberate efforts at the progressive or continuing destabilization of parts of Ukraine. It's very hard to judge how ambitious these goals are, but it is not an accident that in that one single portion in which the Russians actually predominate, one single portion of Ukraine in which they actually predominate, the use of force has been sophisticated. The participants in the effort have been well armed, even tanks certainly effective anti-aircraft weaponry. All of that is something that even uh, disagreeable, uh, disaffected citizens of a country to which they feel they do not belong would be storing somewhere in their attic or in their basement. These are weapons provided, in effect, for the purpose of shaping formations capable of sustaining serious military engagements. It is a form of interstate aggression. You can't call it anything else. How would we feel if all of a sudden, let's say, the uh, drug-oriented gangs in the United States were armed from abroad, from our southern neighbor, by equipment which would permit violence on that scale on a continuing basis? So this is a serious challenge. So that is the second objective. And the third objective is to promote and then discuss with the Russians a formula for an eventual compromise, assuming that in the first instance the use of force openly and on a large scale is deterred and the effort destabilized is abandoned. That means in turn the following, and I will be quite blunt regarding my own views on the subject. Ukraine has to be supported if it is to resist. If Ukraine doesn't resist, if its internal disorder persists in, in its incapacity to organize effective national defense doesn't transpire, then the Ukrainian problem will be resolved unilaterally, but probably with consequential <coughs> effects that will be destabilizing in regards to the vulnerable states and to the totality of the East-West relationship for the forces of Shonevinism, the forces of a new sort of world self-definition will become more strident. And they do represent the most negative aspects of contemporary Russian society, a kind of thirst for nationalism, for self-fulfillment, gratification of the exercise of power. Something which is not pervasive in the new middle class, which is the long-range alternative, but which is certainly not on top of political influence. If Ukraine has to be supported so that it does resist, the Ukrainians have to know that the West is prepared to help them resist. And there's no reason to be secretive about it. It would be much better to be open about it and to say to the Ukrainians, and to those who may threaten Ukraine, that if you resist, if you Ukrainians resist, you will have weapons, and will provide some, no, some of those weapons in advance of the very act of invasion. Because in the absence of that, the temptation to invade and to preempt may become overwhelming. 
But what kind of weapons is important? And in my view, these should be weapons designed particularly to permit the Ukrainians to engage in effective urban warfare of resistance. There's no point trying to arm the Ukrainians who take on the Russian army in the open field. Thousands of tanks, modern army, well organized for some purposes, overwhelming force. But there is a history to be learned from urban resistance in World War II and most recently in Grozny, Chechnya, which resisted for three months in house-to-house -house fighting. And there are some moving examples from World War II, which I do not need to reiterate. The point is, if the effort to invade was to be successful politically, it would have to incorporate taking the major cities. If the major cities, say Kharkiv, say Kiev, were to resist and street fighting became a necessity, it would be prolonged and costly. And the fact of the matter is, and this is where the timing of this whole crisis is important, Russia is not yet ready to undertake that kind of an effort. It will be too costly in blood, paralyzingly costly in finances, and it would take a long time and create more and more international pressure. So I feel that we should make it clear to the Ukrainians that if you are determined to resist, as they say they are, and seemingly they are trying to do so, though not very effectively, we will provide them with anti-tank weapons, handheld anti-tank weapons, handheld rockets, weapons capable for use in urban short-range fighting. This is not an arming of Ukraine for some invasion of Russia. You don't invade a country as large as Russia with defensive weaponry. But if you have defensive weaponry and you have access to it and you know it's arriving, you're more likely to resist. And hence that acts as a deterrence. And that, in turn, can permit then more effective operations to terminate some of the violence that is being sponsored on the borders between Ukraine and Russia. That, I think, would help in any case to contain the risk and the temptation to resolve this issue by force of arms on the Russian side in the context of a mood of great ecstasy over the Crimean success which was quick and decisive, and which encountered no resistance. The temptation to seek its repetition can be quite strong, and appealing to a political leader who desperately needs a major success. But at the same time, we have to engage in some exploration of possible arrangements for a compromise outcome, especially if it becomes clear to the Russians and to Mr. Putin that either destabilizing Ukraine or taking it by force poses great risks and may not be attainable. That has to be accompanied, therefore, by an effort to engage in, in a dialogue. What should be the formula for such a possible compromise? I think it's relatively simple, in fact. Ukraine can proceed with its process, publicly endorsed by an overwhelming majority of Ukrainian people, of becoming part of Europe. But it's a long process. The Turks have been promised that outcome, and they have been engaging in that process already for 60 years. In other words, it's not done very quickly. Therefore, the danger to Russia is not an imminent, and the negative consequences are not so destructive. But at the same time, clarity that Ukraine will not be a member of NATO. I think that is important for a variety of geopolitical reasons. If you look at the map, it's important from the psychological strategic point of view. Hence, Ukraine will not be a member of NATO. But by the same token, Russia has to understand that Ukraine will not be member of some mythical Eurasian Union that President Putin is trying to promote on the basis of this new doctrine of a special position for Russia in the world and special claims outside of Russia vis-a-vis -vis some of its fellow natives. Ukraine will not be a member of the Eurasian Union, but Ukraine can have a separate trade agreement with Russia, partic particularly taking into account the mutual benefits of the fact that certain forms of exchange and trade are mutually beneficial.
agricultural products, for example, from Ukraine to Russia, industrial products that Russia needs and are being produced in Ukraine. Not many people realize that some of Russia's best rockets, most of the engines for Russian civil aviation, and some of the rockets used by the United States are produced in Ukraine. It's a profitable and successful industrial enterprise. And that, therefore, should be continued under an arrangement whereby Ukraine and Russia have a special treaty. I think something like this might actually at some point become appealing. And it should be surfaced, but it should be surfaced in the context of an open, not covert, but an open actions designed to convince the Russians that any use of force will have negative but enduring consequences for Russia itself, not involving a threat to Russia's security, but involving rising costs of the assertion of Russia's power at the cost of Ukrainian independence. In my view, in that context, NATO should also act somewhat more assertively in reducing the insecurity of those NATO countries that border on Russia and happen to have, on the average, about 25% of its population constituted of Russian nationals. I speak specifically of Estonia and Latvia. America has committed its presence there. I would think it would be very productive if, in addition to America, some leading European states, notably Germany, France, and Great Britain, deployed some symbolic forces in these three countries so that they're there too, and not just Americans, on a regular basis, on a regular basis, so that this would reaffirm the fact that NATO stands in the context of this problem together. In international politics, symbolism is as important as decisiveness, and symbolism can avert the necessity for extreme measures. Given the current consequences of the very massive expansion of NATO in the last several decades to 28 members, it might be also appropriate in the light of the ongoing experience that we are in the process of assimilating to take another look at the structure of NATO itself. And I have in mind particularly a review of the historical paradox involved in its not much mentioned but potentially very important Article 5. Article 5 is the article which provides for the procedure that the alliance follows in undertaking a military response to an aggression directed at it in general or at one or two or more of its members. You doubtless recall that Article 5 has a provision that decisions to engage in hostilities by the alliance have to be unanimous which in other words means that a single country has a veto. It was the United States that insisted on this provision when NATO was first formed. And it insisted on it in order to obtain popular support from it in the American Congress from the isolationist portions of the American body politic, which feared that an alliance of this sort would violate American tradition of no foreign entanglements. The argument was, this gives America what it needs to avoid a foreign entanglement. Unfortunately, today, with 28 members of varying degree of capacity for participating in military action, and unfortunately of some varying degree of genuine political commitment to some of the security assumptions of the alliance, the situation has become reversed. It is some of the new allies that may be tempted in some circumstances to invoke Article 5. Not entirely preventing NATO from responding, because I'm convinced that if that were to happen, after some prolonged debates, much resentment, internal threats, the country that was trying to prevent NATO from acting would be persuaded to join, or de facto taken out of the alliance. But I think it would be wiser to review this provision in a more patient atmosphere, in spite of the circumstances that prevail today. One possible solution might be simply the 
adoption of note of the of the provision that there will be no veto right in the alliance for sustained enduring underperformers of jointly agreed commitments some members of nato don't meet their commitments even by some remote approximation they just do not and hence their membership in nato is a free ride altogether why should a member that doesn't meet nato commitments practically in total then have the right to veto mem the members the other members right to engage in collective self-defense it's an anomaly and p potential source of gridlock and confusion as this crisis is gradually resolved i hope nato will take another look at it and will also look at the issue of additional new members in nato more critically it doesn't follow that a country in whose security nato has an interest has to be in nato nato can have an interest in its security but without having it in nato and have a variety of understandings regarding how it might respond there is some talk of new members in the eu and perhaps some of these will seek nato membership and in recent years some countries have obtained nato membership while being territorially remote from the possible conflicts on the east-west dividing line i think more discretion here may be actually beneficial and some reflection on this subject might in fact enhance nato credibility and create some pressure on those members who wish to be active members in nato to do more to meet the commitments they have formally undertaken finally and looking much further ahead i think that one way or another with or without a compromise solution crimea is going to become a serious economic burden for russia there is no way that the kind of economic activity in which crimea has been able to engage and quite profitably named as a major source of tourism and visits and international liners on a large scale coming into its ports and foreign tourists engaging in trade collection of uh, souvenirs and so forth can be sustained as long as the international community doesn't formally recognize the incorporation of Crimea into Russia it means that the exploration of the underwater resources within Crimea's territorial confines of the sea cannot be undertaken by international companies because they'll be subject to suits from a variety of interested parties in brief Russia faces the prospect of the necessity of subsidizing on a significant scale economic activity in Crimea to the benefit of its citizens prices consumer prices have already risen threefold since the incorporation of Crimea into Russia this situation creates a potentially serious liability for Russia which already is in a relatively weak economic position beyond that there is the potential reality which I think will become a during fact as Ukraine succeeds that Russia in the process has created the enduring reality of hostility towards Russia on the basis of some 40 million people unlike many other Slavs Ukrainians have not been anti-Russian historically and certainly there's no comparison between its attitude traditionally towards Russia and that of the Poles next door the Poles have repeatedly fought for their independence against the Russians and have strong feelings and enduring feelings on the subject enmity towards Russia is new but it's becoming very intense and the entire new generation of Ukrainians born in freedom and national sovereignty reflected the strongest Ukraine therefore will involve not only an enduring problem for Russia in that respect but the permanent loss of a huge swath of territory the greatest loss of territory suffered by Russia in the course of its imperial expansion this may in turn eventually begin to work against this new mythology regarding Russia's place and role in the world with which I started my presentation it may be refuted by realities
And this is why I am increasingly hopeful that the new emerging Russian middle class, realizing that the kind of mythology that Putin has adopted and which a significant portion of the less educated, more chauvinistic Russians have absorbed and embraced is the road to nowhere. That the real place of Russia as an important country is in Europe, as a major European country. And they'll be reminded of that imperative every time they look to the East and ask themselves, what does that mean for the future of Russia? Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Brzezinski, for these brilliant remarks, very clearly laying out your views on uh, Russian motivations and uh, uh, Western actions. We now uh, have the privilege uh, to have uh, comments by um, Ambassador Stephen Pfeiffer, who is, of course, the director of the Brookings Arms Control and Nonproliferation Initiative, um, served for 25 years in the State Department, including of course, as ambassador to Ukraine from 1998 to 2000. Ambassador Pfeiffer. Well, thank you very much, and uh, thank you to the um, Woodrow Wilson Center for inviting me here. Um, it's uh, awfully hard to follow Dr. Brzezinski when he covers such a broad uh, bit of uh, history or, or of current history, and he does it in such comprehensive and such terrific terms. So uh, some of my comments will be mainly underscoring points that he made. Uh, and I would agree completely that the, the thing that the West needs to do is support Ukraine. Uh, it seems to me that the best rebuke to the Kremlin's policy of the last six months would be if three to four years from now, Ukraine is looking each day more and more like Poland, a normal, democratic, rule of law, European country. Uh, and I think the West can do things uh, to help make that happen, including in terms of economic support, advice on things like energy diversification, which is going to be a real issue today with uh, Gazprom's decision to uh, reduce the gas flows to Ukraine. Uh, I, w I would second uh, his uh, point about provision of military assistance to Ukraine. Uh, certainly non-lethal assistance makes sense, but uh, light anti-armor weapons and manned portable air defense systems make sense uh, in terms of making sure that the Russian military, which I believe is not eager to go into eastern Ukraine, I, I think they worry precisely about the sorts of urban fighting that Dr. Brzezinski described, and they, they're not eager for that. Uh, but we ought to be providing weapons to the Ukrainian military to, in fact, affect that calculation. And particularly in the case of manned portable air defense systems, I, there's almost sort of an obligation for NATO, which over the last 10 years has been running programs to destroy stocks of Ukrainian man pads. A second direction is the, the point of assuring NATO countries, particularly those in uh, Central Europe, who today are much more nervous about Russia, Russian policies, and Russian actions than they were six months ago. Uh, the U.S. military has deployed four companies of airborne forces, 150 troops each, to Poland, Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia. Uh, I think that is a good response. The Pentagon says that is persistent, uh, that it will last for up to a year. I think having ground forces like that, which do not have heavy equipment, do not have significant offensive capability, but are a tangible signal of American commitment is important. Uh, I would agree it would be useful to have them joined by European forces. Uh, for example, a, a German company paired with the American company in Lithuania, a British company paired with the American company in Poland, a Dutch company paired with the American company in Estonia, to make clear to Russia that the commitment is a NATO commitment. It's not just an American commitment. And again, I think it can be done in a way that would not be provocative, uh, very much like the Berlin Brigade and uh, its British and French counterparts for 30 years, vastly outnumbered by Soviet and East German forces, uh, still managed to keep West Berlin free by their presence. Uh, the third area I think that the West needs to work on and, and perhaps needs to work a bit more on is the question of sanctions on Russia. And the, the goal of these sanctions should be to change Russian policy. And there is evidence that comes in now that suggests that those sanctions, which to date are relatively modest, have had an economic impact on Russia. For, for example, Russian companies in 2013 were able to sell foreign currency bonds worth about $43 billion. In January and February, they sold those bonds for about $6 billion. Since March, they've sold zero. So I, I think the sanctions are successful in their economic impact, uh, 
uh, but they have failed in their primary political purpose, which is to affect a change of policy um, in the Kremlin. Uh, and, and I worry that the West has not handled the sanctions process well. Uh, the last day on which the United States and the European Union announced sanctions together at the end of uh, April, the Russian stock market gained 1.5%. I would suggest that's not a positive signal for the effectiveness of sanctions. On May 2nd, President Obama and Chancellor Merkel said that if Russia interfered with the May 25 presidential elections, there would be sanctions. Uh, a substantial portion of the Ukrainian electorate in Donetsk and Luhansk could not participate in that election because of activities by armed separatists supported by Moscow. We've not seen any punishment for that. And then the G7, when they met uh, in Normandy, uh, said that there would be additional sanctions over the course of the next month if Russia stopped being part of the problem. Uh, but again, I think we've seen continued problems, including the introduction of heavy weapons on the part of the separatists, tanks, uh, missile launchers, and, and I think fairly sophisticated air defenses, uh, as evidenced by the shoot down of the uh, Ukrainian Aleutian 76 on Friday evening. Uh, so I, I think the West needs to be tougher in terms of imposing costs if we're going to try to encourage the Russians to shift their policy. The last point I think I would agree is there is, it does seem to me that if the Russians are prepared to be a part of the solution, you can see the elements of a compromise. Uh, the government in Kyiv has talked about decentralization of power, decentralization of political authority, which makes sense. Governors in the region should be elected, not appointed by the president. They've talked about some status for Russian language, which addresses some of the concerns expressed by those in the East. There's talk of early parliamentary elections, uh, which would be a good step. It would revalidate the democratic legitimacy of the Ukrainian parliament in the way that the May 25 election gave the president a new democratic mandate. And as Dr. Brzezinski suggested, I think you can see the elements in terms of how Ukraine orients itself in terms of foreign policy, drawing closer to the European Union, uh, but not pursuing NATO. I, I, I would try to craft some language that said, not ask Ukraine to say, no how, no way, never. But you can certainly finesse this issue and make clear to the Russians that NATO is not on the agenda for the foreseeable future. And the most important reason that Ukraine would want to pursue that is not a foreign policy reason, but that would be usually controversial within Ukraine. President Poroshenko is trying to find a way to mend internal divisions. He does not need the controversy that NATO would provoke with Eastern Ukraine. So I think those are the elements, uh, and I would agree on the case of Crimea. Uh, perhaps the way to handle Crimea is to set that aside. Uh, it's not going to be addressed early on. Uh, my own analytical judgment is it's very hard to see uh, a scenario in which Ukraine is able to regain sovereignty over Crimea, but that does not mean that the West should accept it, and the West should continue a policy of non-recognition until such time, uh, if and when the Ukrainians decide to do something otherwise. But that can be an issue that you perhaps put down the road. The other pieces here might put together a, a basis for a compromise that would help mend the divisions within Ukraine, uh, and I think could be an acceptable way forward. Uh, but I think the big question here is, at the end of the day, is that still acceptable to Russia? Uh, I, I'm not sure that the Russians are happy just with Ukraine saying no NATO. Um, I think the Russians still are unhappy with the idea that Ukraine wants to draw, and, and this is not just the president, but it's also the parliament and I think a majority of the Ukrainian people, that they want to draw closer to the European Union. Uh, when you look at the association agreement and, and what that agreement does, if, and it's a big if, if the Ukrainians were to implement it, but if Ukraine implements the EU association agreement, uh, it is irretrievably out of Moscow's geopolitical orbit. And I think that still remains a sticking point for the Russians. Thank you very much, Ambassador Pfeiffer. I think we uh, I want to quickly get to your um, questions and comments, so get ready. But before we do that, I'd like to give Ambassador Ishing an opportunity to respond to Dr. Brzezinski's uh, remarks. Uh, very little to add. Thank you, uh, Zbig, for, for a brilliant uh, presentation. And thanks, Steve, for your comments. Just, just a few uh, very brief points I, I'd like to add from my point of view. First, in a way, and I mean this only half cynical, we can say thank you, Vladimir Putin, for reminding us that there is a good reason for having NATO. NATO was in the process of getting off the radar screen a little bit of major 
of the major European and transatlantic debate. Now it's back on the on the radar screen, and that's good. Second, um, President Putin has also, by doing what he did, reminded Europeans that there is an overwhelmingly good reason for trying to get our act together in terms of speaking with one voice, for the EU to be uh, a political actor that can exercise um, a significant role, as it should, representing 500 million people. Uh, and third, I think these events are in the process, are already re-energizing the debate about how best European countries, including my own, can uh, unburden itself from a too great a dependency on uh, energy imports from Russia. So that's actually all pretty good. Second point, when you discuss delivery of support, uh, extension of support, including weaponry to Ukrainians, the one problem I believe we would run into is that the, the Ukrainian military is in terrible shape. And that is not the fault of the Russians or of anybody else. It's simply the fact that they have been understaffed, underfinanced, under-equipped, and it's not going to be very easy over the short period to make of this rather sorry state uh, of the Ukraine military something that can uh, work efficiently as a, as a, as a, as a military body. Th next point, deploying NATO forces to eastern NATO countries like Poland or the three Baltic states. Um, we will have here at the Wilson Center, if I can make a little advertisement, in, in a couple of days, the new German defense minister, Ursula von der Leyen, and I'm sure somebody is going to ask her that question, whether Germany should or could uh, join those who have already uh, taken some steps. The one word of caution I would add is that we should think twice before we violate the promise we made in the context of the NATO-Russia Founding Act uh, almost 20 years ago, when we said that we would not permanently deploy major combat troops uh, in East, in the new, among the new NATO members. Now, I think this can be handled. Uh, major con combat troops is uh, something that is can be interpreted, but sending for uh, sending a smaller force, sending a few airplanes, is probably not a major combat force. And I think even symbolic acts would be helpful in the sense that Dr. Brzezinski has suggested. Finally, last point, one point that has not been mentioned, I believe merits being mentioned. President Putin has not only un, um, uh, uh, has, has not only challenged the European security architecture, as Dr. Brzezinski described it, he has al also um, presented a challenge to the very idea of European integration, to the idea of Europe. Uh, is it not amazing that not only the post-communist leaders of West European parties, including the Linke in my own country is traveling to Moscow to conduct discussions with the Russian leadership. Uh, uh, that's normal. But it is very surprising, certainly to me and I'm sure to many in, in my country, that Marine Le Pen and many other right-wing leaders in Europe have discovered that Vladimir Putin is their hero, the hero of something that rejects overcoming the nation state, that, 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 that looks for nationalistic leadership. There is a strange, these are strange bedfellows, the European right wing and uh, President Putin. And, and in my view, this is a, fun, a rather fundamental challenge to the very concept um, of Europe. I'll stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh, let's go to uh, your question and answers. If you could please wait for the microphone. It's coming right there. And we'll
Let's start with um, President Harmon. Thank you all. Zbig, I, I remember you uh, talking in the cabinet meetings of the uh, Carter White House, and uh, I think it was your warm-up act. This was just magnificent. Thank you very much for coming here. Uh, my question is about an organization that got very little mention, but Wolfgang recently spent a lot of time connected to it, and that is the OSCE. The OSCE Secretary General, uh, Lamberto Zanier, was here about a month ago, and it was the roundtables in Ukraine that Wolfgang chaired that are credited to, to some extent with really encouraging Ukrainians to participate in the election. It is true, as uh, Ambassador Pfeiffer said, that uh, unfortunately some in the eastern part of Ukraine couldn't participate, but the turnout was substantial, uh, in the si above 60 percent, better than our elections. So my question is, uh, could the OSCE, which is a security organization, which includes Russia, and, but which operates by consensus, play a bigger role in um, uh, negotiating a, a, an outcome here that would uh, be satisfactory both to uh, the West and to Russia and benefit Ukraine? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, I suppose it, <clears throat> I suppose it could, but probably at this stage, only sub rosa. In other words, the discussions were informal and basically not open to the press and conducted in private. Because right now we're not at a stage at which it is likely that they could lead to something very positive. But certainly doors should be open to that. So it's, it, I think it's, it's desirable. Could I make just two comments on what also was said earlier? Uh, very briefly on the arms. The arms are, the ones I'm talking about are defensive. They're for urban warfare. They cannot be used offensively against Russia. So there's really no reason to say that this is provocative to Russia. And it doesn't require a lot of military sophistication to use them, which means that if the military is disorganized, as you rightly say, Wolfgang, they are, civilians who are motivated can take part in it. And that really works. I mean, I could regale you with some stories about what happened when the Russians tried to storm Grozny and how surprised they were. Mm -hmm. And certainly during World War II, there were examples of urban warfare that endured. So it's a very useful way of simply conveying to the Russians, don't expect an easy walk in, because it's going to be painful, costly, prolonged. Um, on the one more aspect, and this pertains a little bit to what you asked, uh, Jane, namely the dialogue with the Russians. Right now, the Russians are really in a phase in which they are trying to mobilize global support of Western reactionaries, and that's what you referred to. And the interesting thing about the Western reactionaries is that they like the content of what the Russians describe as the Russian global civilization. That is to say, anti-modernistic, um, it's socially, sexually reactionary, mm -hmm. it's kind of drawn inward, but very self-righteous. And this is what makes the new Western right-wingers all of a sudden the equivalent of the old Western left-wingers who loved Russian communism. Uh, so we're seeing a flip around here. But my guess is that the changing character of Russian society over time, particularly changing character of the middle class in the big cities, is going to spell the doom of that once two things happen. Putin is not successful in militarily asserting himself, and two, at some point, one way or another, is no longer the central player. Thank you. Ambassador Ishing on OSCE. I, I just might, I, I think uh, it remains to be seen whether OSCE could play a role in the actual negotiation of the settlement. And again, I think a lot of that depends on how the Russians approach this. But certainly, if you did have a settlement, it seems to me that OSC mechanisms, the monitors, could be hugely important in getting ground truth, building confidence on the part of the Ukrainian population that whatever accords worked out will hold. One, uh, if I may, one brief word on, on that. We had, on the 17th of April, a meeting in Geneva between John Kerry, Sergei Lavrov, the European Union, and the Ukrainian government. That was, so far, unfortunately, only a one-time event. And in my view, it is highly desirable that a second Geneva, Geneva II, as, as we've tended to call it, should, um, should take place. And OSCE, I think, is a good organization to support and implement and help implement um, the kinds of um, decisions that were taken already in Geneva 
one and are still not fully implemented, uh, unfortunately. But so I, I do agree that OSE has a potentially important and continuing role to play in supporting what at a different level needs to be hammered out between the U.S., the European Union, the Ukrainians themselves, and of course the Russian government. Thank you. Yes, over there. Please state your name and affiliation. Mm -hmm. Microphone. Yep, yeah. right there. Yep. <coughs> Steve Larrabee, Rand Corporation. A quick comment to <coughs> Wolfgang. Speak up, please. Uh, Quick comment to Wolfgang and then a question for Dr. Brzezinski. Wolfgang, that statement that you mentioned in the, uh, regarding troop, troops and so forth, that was predicated, the beginning of that sentence is very important that we, uh, because it said, as long as the current security situation does not change. Yeah. Well, it certainly changed when one country invades an another and annexes it. So that it tries to annex it. So that, I mean, I think the situation most people would say has radically changed, and therefore, Western policy is no longer obligated by that state that statement. To Zvig, I would say, I want to to get your reaction to to China. How do you think China looks at this? Because they certainly were not very happy with the annexation of Crimea, and what. Uh, implications you think that this might have for U.S. relations with China? You want me to do that? Yeah. I have to say that, regrettably, in my view, neither China nor Russia, and neither China nor America, have handled their relationship all that well in the last couple of years. Yeah. I'm not thinking just of the American press, I think I'm thinking of some American official pronouncements and then actions such as the pivot speech, which unfortunately, I think, was not uh, well worded because its intent was not to give the impression that the United States is committed to the physical military containment of China, but the emphasis on pivoting, on the pivot, on the reallocation of troops on the deployment of troops in Australia, which as far as I know is not under the imminent threat of an attack from Papua New Guinea, so it had to be China. And gave the Chinese the impression that we are really sliding into a position of siding with whatever neighbor of China has a territorial conflict with China. That's an exaggeration, but that's the way they have interpreted it. And secondly, on the Chinese side, in the last year or so, there has been a dramatic increase, I follow this very closely, a dramatic increase in public pronouncements in the officially controlled and censored press, but also in the statements of particular officials from different parts of the government, and notably the military, extremely hostile to the United States. So I think this relationship needs some careful tending and correction. However, on the Russian-American, quote-unquote, conflict, the Chinese have been scrupulously neutral with the effect of, of course, not backing the Russians who would have wished for such backing. In the UN, the Chinese abstained. So they did not support the motion that was introduced, but they did not vote against it as the Russians did. It was a kind of in-between posture reflecting a preoccupation with their own national interest more than anything else. And incidentally, a posture copied, not much noticed in the American press, by Israel, who is, of course, the principal beneficiary of our, our military assistance, political assistance, and so forth. And they took this neutral position for their own reasons and interests. And so one should be too surprised that the Chinese did it too. Uh, in the Russian-Chinese relationship, I think what we are seeing is a gradually increasing Russian dependence on China. That 30-year treaty, by and large, is more advantageous to China than to Russia, even though the Chinese squeeze the Russians into some price concessions. Because the fact remains that the major financial investments, 
in order to make this treaty operative are going to be made by the Russians in communications, uh, facilities, pipelines, and so forth. And the Chinese are going to have alternatives in terms of price as soon as Iran opens up, as soon as they reach out to deal with Saudi Arabia, and so forth. And therefore, at some point, the Chinese will be able to go to the Russians and say, well, it's very nice, we value this treaty, but you really have to lower the price because the world price is going down and we have these options. And the Russians will have no choice. They'll have to accommodate which means that the benefits of that treaty will be increasingly favorable to the Chinese, who are at the same time moving into Central Asia, quite visibly and openly. Thank you. Yes, the center. Uh, thank you. Uh, Obrad Kasich, the RS Office for Cooperation, Trade, Investment. I have uh, two questions, one pertaining to trust. I think one of the common elements that I picked up on is there's a definite lack of trust of the Russians. And my question is, is what makes you think that we can build trust with the Russians because it's on the basis of our actions over the previous years in terms of invading countries, in terms of spying on our own citizens, in terms of illegal detentions, in terms of our own disregard of international law, what makes you think that we can somehow convince the Russians to sit at a table and trust us if we don't trust them, with good reason, given what, what you have all described. How do we get back to building trust? And the second uh, question pertains to uh, the cost of doing what you have said. Uh, it's clear in terms of the cost you've laid out, laid out for the Russians, but what's the cost in supporting Ukraine for Europe and for the U.S.? How much is that going to cost, and can that be borne, the burden, by the recovering economies of Europe in particular? Thank you. I'd like to take that on. Well, I, I, I can answer the second question. Um, Ukraine uh, struck a deal with the International Monetary Fund, uh, and uh, the IMF has agreed to provide Ukraine uh, $17 billion over two years, provided, and this is a very important provided, provided that Ukraine does the necessary reform steps that are required in the program. Uh, and, and so the way the IMF doles out the money is every several months there's a review if Ukraine has met the uh, uh, conditionalities it's agreed to in terms of reform steps, um, then they get the next dollop of money. Uh, it was interesting, um, there have been a lot of IMF missions to Ukraine over the last 20 years. Uh, and usually uh, the mission would go there and sit down with the Ukrainians and say, here's the problem. And then it would be the IMF mission saying, here's what you need to do. What I understand was in March when the IMF mission went to meet with the new acting government for the first time in, in dealing with independent Ukraine, the acting government said, here's our to-do list. And it was the right to-do list. I mean, I, I, I think, you know, people like acting Prime Minister Yatsenyuk, I think uh, President Poroshenko, they understand the economic reform steps that Ukraine has to take. Um, you know, th th there's been uh, discussions with the Ukrainian governments about these for 20 years. The real question will be is, can they sustain the political support for these steps, which are going to be, in some cases, very painful? So, for example, to get access to the program, to start the program on May 1st, Ukraine raised the price of heating to every household. May 1st is a great time to raise the price of heating because nobody needs it. But in November, December, when the temperature's down in the 20s and the teens, people are going to notice that their heating bills are way, way up. And at that point, politically, is the government going to be able to say to the public, we need to do this, we need to get to the next couple of years. And, and, and moreover, it doesn't stop with the IMF. With the IMF program in place, then there are other funds available from the World Bank, the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, the European Union. And, and so Ukraine has potentially access to 25 to $35 billion over the next couple of years, primarily in, in, in the form of, of uh, low interest loans. And that should help Ukraine get through this period if they do the right things. Wolfgang, would you like to take on the trust question, the first part of the question? Uh, yeah, uh, I'll be very brief. I mean, I don't think it is uh, fair to compare Russian behavior on Ukraine and and especially Crimea with with Western uh, behavior going that's that's a very popular thing for Russians to claim that we are at fault because as Russians say we the West we uh, aggressed uh, 
the former Yugoslavia. We did what we did in Libya and, uh, in, in, of course, in Iraq, etc. I believe that uh, it is important to note that, for example, in the case of Libya, we, the West, certainly the United States, went to the Security Council of the United Nations and obtained, actually with Russian abstention at the time, a resolution endorsing activities directed at Libya. The same is true in uh, an, a number of other uh, activities. We went to the Security Council I don't know how many times trying to find a way forward on Syria, trying to find a, a way forward on Kosovo and on Bosnia, etc. Et in four years. I, kn I am not aware that the Russian Federation tr even tried, not even once, to seize the Security Council to authorize uh, uh, Russian action on Crimea. So I think it's the comparison is not fair. I would grant you a, one point. You, the European security architecture, architecture as it exists with institutions like NATO, the NATO Russia Council, OSCE, etc., is not working the way it should. Uh, we, do not, we do not have a sufficiently functioning body of institutions and rules. That's, uh, that's my take from what we're witnessing. So that needs to be improved and repaired. But in order to do it, you need to have a minimum of trust that all actors are, you know, singing from the same page. And that's very hard now that we have had such a terif uh, terrible loss of trust in the predictability uh, uh, of, of, of Russian uh, policy uh, uh, as it happened over the last few months. Thank you. Uh, David Ignatius, what, that will probably be our final question. Um, thank you. I want to ask uh, Ambassador uh, Ischinger for his assessment of whether Germany, meaning both the government of Chancellor Merkel and the German people, uh, whether Germany is prepared to support the uh, policies of deterring this chauvinist Russia that uh, Dr. Brzezinski described, um, even though Germany will pay significant costs in doing so. Yeah. David, I think yes, but the question is how? How exactly? Um, if you take the majority view among the German public, you, w you find a lot of skepticism regarding our, our jointly adopted decision on sanctions. You will find a lot of skepticism regarding the question of weapons delivery. You will find a lot of skepticism regarding deployment of, um, of military force to eastern NATO countries. In other words, there are obstacles to overcome in terms of, uh, of public opinion. And quite frankly, as much as I personally agree with the point that um, our Eastern NATO members need to be reassured, uh, should be reassured by uh, certain types of activity, including symbolic or not so symbolic military deployments, I think that our priority number one needs to be to stabilize Ukraine. and. Quite frankly, by sending a few airplanes to Estonia or to uh, Poland, we are not directly doing anything to help these poor Ukrainians to handle their problems. So I think the first objective, the first priority needs to be things that will help Ukraine, Ukraine directly. I know of having, having been involved in these discussions over how to deal with the Ukrainian crisis you know, over the last uh, month or so, I know of no leader, certainly no leader in Europe, who has spent more time uh, trying to explain to President Putin that he's making a mistake, a big one. Um, and um, I think Chancellor Merkel has also been quite successful, surprisingly successful, in convincing the German business community, which has a much larger stake in 
the Russian business than the U.S. business community, that the German business community should not oppose sanctions against Russia. In fact, just over this past weekend, the leadership of the German business community, the BDI, issued a statement supporting with pain, as they said. You know, we, 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 for us this is painful, but we accept that this has to be um, the prerogative of political decision-making among transatlantic partners, and if they believe that sanctions are needed and maybe more sanctions are needed, then so be it. That's a painful thing for somebody to say who actually represents many hundreds, if not thousands, of large and small businesses who have been doing a lot of business with uh, Russia and with their subsidiaries in Russia. So it's not a small thing. I very much agree with what Wolfgang just said about the problems, and especially the, the problems that the Europeans and the Germans face when it comes to subsidies. Uh, not subsidies, uh, sanctions. Um, I just want to add a little bit to it. Namely, it's true that their difficulties in that regard are greater than our difficulties. But we also have expenses. For example, the president has just committed $1 billion for the reinforcement of Central European security. That will come out of the pockets of the voters. But it is a step in the same direction so that we assume certain obligations and difficulties, costs as well. Um, I also think that, in any case, solidarity is what is essential. And solidarity need not be only tangible. It can be symbolic. And anything that our European allies can do to show that the issue of European security is of common concern and a common responsibility is to the good. And it's not an anti-Russian step. It is a stabilizing step. In the last several years, the Russians have held several exercises, military exercises, in its western territories. In fact, in large measure, on Belarus soil, which brings them much closer to the Baltic states. And these are enormous exercises by our standards. Large army formations repelling an alleged attack and then moving forward. And the last one ended with a simulated nuclear attack on a Central European capital. Nuclear attack. No one has used nuclear weapons since 1945. I mean, these are things that we haven't paid much attention to, but they're part of this equation. And building security has to be very much a reciprocal responsibility in addition to solidarity in the face of challenge. Thank you so much. Uh, this was a terrific roundtable. Let me just uh, uh, congratulate Ambassador Ishinger again on the volume. Highly recommended to all of you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Brzezinski, for uh, your extraordinary keynote, uh, your very thoughtful uh, comments, Ambassador Pfeiffer, and all of you for joining us. We're adjourned. Thank you so much. We have a, 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 a,